I went to Queens when it was all female, and then I worked here beginning in 83 and became the alumni director. In 1987, I was asked to be a part of the committee to decide whether Queens should go co-ed. And we did vote to go co-ed in 87. And one of the most exciting things that Dr. Werman, who was the then president, said, we're going to really up the athletic teams at Queens. And so immediately he hired a wonderful new coach, Dale Lair, and they started men's basketball and women's. We'd been an all-women's college for a long, long time, and the, when the decision was made to go co-ed, that decision was made unbeknownst to the, the students who had gone home um, and were coming back in the fall. They went home from an all-women's college, they came back to a co-ed college. I remember when the guys first showed up on campus, it had been really kind of a hard-fought battle to convince people it would be a great idea to have guys. And then when this bunch, a really tall, good-looking, athletic, pleasant, smart young men showed up, it made the sale a whole lot easier. But I, I think the establishment of the basketball program here at Queens was a, an accomplishment that very few people actually imagined would ever take place. Uh, so what um, Dale did here uh, was to fulfill uh, some of Billy Wireman's vision. And so I was very pleased uh, when it was announced that uh, we would have a men's basketball team and I was also pleased that Billy Wireman was able to bring in Dale Lair who was a class act in every way. Uh, the, the late 80s, early 90s were an interesting time anyway, but then when you throw 32 guys on a college campus that had been an all-female institution for 132 years, uh, it became a lot more interesting. Um, I mean, the guys that we selected that came here that were, I mean, the men's basketball team, the men's tennis team, um, some of the others, I mean, they truly were pioneers. I mean, they, they had many options. Um, to, to choose from and they chose to do something very, very different than all of their friends. Uh, I can't imagine what it was like for the first four guys who were here. They must have played a lot of horse. Um, and I, I really think that it took a special kind of, of a person to accept that challenge. Uh, Bobby Lindauer reminded me that I gave him his campus tour. Um, so it must have been a good one, <laughs> I would think. Um, and I think you might could say that about this, this group of guys who came to Queensland. This first group came in, what were they thinking? It must have been hard to be um, so few and to know that you were making history. There must have been some pressure there. I quickly realized that a new day was dawning, however. The day before the students came, the first basketball team being part of the new student uh, group, a staff member came to my office and said, lady, you got a problem. What? We haven't even got students here yet. Campus looks really pretty, but you know what? Those basketball players aren't going to fit in our beds. They're all too short. Evan Agaloff was one of my advisees, and I sat in my office, which is a rather large office, and I'd always thought I had plenty of space in there until Evan and his tennis shoes showed up. And frankly, for our first advising meeting, all I could do was stare at his feet, going, good heavens, that boy has big shoes. It was a very intimate experience. The guys were very close. There wasn't a whole lot of us and them and the jocks and the scholars and all that stuff going on. You just couldn't do that in this environment. It was just a very tight, close-knit group of guys and the fun part was when that all changed when the team got on the floor and suddenly it just clicked it was amazing to watch it happen but it's as if it had been there all along of course you know the faculty and, and alumni were not that used to Queens having really good basketball and I remember a number of the faculty went to some of the first games and one of the faculty members that went with me was Dr. Charles Hadley who had taught here since 1955 and he's not that much of an athlete, so we went to the game and everybody was cheering and yelling and all of a sudden he asked me, he turned to me and said, why are all those people running up and down that court after that same ball? And he just said, I just don't get it. Uh, but home games, it was, it, it was amazing. I mean, we immediately, uh, it was our house and we, we had um, home court advantage from day one. Um, 
and I don't think teams knew what, what hit them. I think they were expecting, you know, this first year, second year team to, to not be much. But. Going to basketball games became the first thing that men and women on this campus did together. Um, on a weeknight, we were going to basketball games. We stayed around on weekends to go to basketball games together. That is really the precursor to what Queens University today is in terms of school spirit. Um, we really started identifying ourselves as royals. You know, our expectations were so low, and yet they so exceeded those expectations. So we were going to be there and cheer no matter what, but it was our team. And for them to come out and win the first five was just like, oh, these guys are incredible. What, what happened here? You know, again, that feeling of this has just been this way all along, kept running all the way through it. We, we didn't know what we were doing. We were just having a good time. And, you know, here they are going into gymnasiums, and people still think that Queens is a women's institution. And these guys got on the court and played just beautiful, beautiful basketball. Um, and all of a sudden, Queens started being more than just a girls' school. Well, we did. We were um, fortunate, um, certainly those at, from the very beginning, that the press did take interest in what we were doing and noticed that it was it was unique and special and catch it now because there's not going to be another first. Uh, College basketball officially underway this weekend, and this year there's a brand new team to watch, the Queens College Royals. Well, we have the 49ers and the uh, Golden Bulls and the Wildcats, and now the Queens Royals right here at Queens College. Yes. Um, I remember about Queens when they started, there was just an incredible sense of excitement over here. We had a lot of girls on campus and now we're bringing you know, more boys in and the athletes and Coach Lair has so much uh, excitement and energy and I came over, he was just telling me we're going to win big, we're going to win big. I'm like, Coach, you're not going to win big because you're a brand new program. And lo and behold, they did win big very quickly. They beat Everett the first, uh, second home game, first home game they won. I remember everybody was dressed up in like Roman outfits and things and the place was just packed. There was just a sense of excitement. And then he had that little gym and it would fill up so quick and it was so loud. You could only sit on one side so the home guys would sit inside the visiting guys. Sometimes they wanted to fight in the middle. And it was just fun basketball. And then to have a guy like Walt Takers come over and be such a tremendous player so quickly, a little left-handed guy could jump out of the gym. And then they developed a rivalry with uh, Johnson C. Smith, which was great. And they became like the Steelers and the Cowboys. I mean, they really wanted to beat each other. And it was just fun. That, that time in Charlotte was just fun. The Hornets were just starting. The Panthers weren't here. Basketball was so much bigger than it is now. And uh, it just came along at the right time. And then to think that Queens were going and have Elite Eight runs under Coach Lair and 20 win seasons was just phenomenal. I couldn't have foreseen that stuff when they started. But I did know they had the right guy in Dale Lair. I always said that guy is a big time basketball coach. And it was just fun to be around the program during that time. There we are. So the day of the first game is what I really remember the best. Uh, Stacy was absolutely bouncing off the walls. He was so excited. He'd been at Queens, he'd been waiting, he was ready for this game. Lunchtime, we met with a reporter from the Chronicle of Higher Education who was there to document this women's college, goes co-ed, joins the NCAA. So I thought I made some useful comments in the, in the lunch. Flash forward to the game. They played, they won. It was incredibly exciting. Right after the first game, Chronicle story comes out, and there it is. Reporter sets the scene. The students are differing with a referee's call and they're yelling, bull dash, bull dash, okay? Billy Wireman is quoted as saying, isn't it great that the students are so into the game and doesn't this bring a lot of excitement and so forth? Fourth paragraph, fourth paragraph of the story, it says, even the faculty get into the act. Ref, if you had another eye, you'd be a cyclops, says Emily Sealbinder, assistant professor of English. <laughs> I was, I was mortified, absolutely mortified. I thought, okay, great, all the things I could say, that's what makes it into the Chronicle of Higher Education. My first quote in the, and only quote, in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and it's, ref, if you had another eye, you'd be a cyclops. You uh, know, sure. We're in this small you know, gymnasium that's smaller than the one I had in high school. Uh, you know, it's hot as all creation. It was called the oven for a reason, but, you know, it was just coincidence that the facility happened to be ovens. 
but it certainly lived up to that billing, but the crowd would just get into it. And we, you know, I guess that, that spirit of being so close to these guys made it so easy to just put everything out there. Um, immediately, Johnson C. Smith was uh, an instant rival. And when you put their team on our home court along with their fans, um, we could have filled up easily two or three ovens and um, I'm sure the, the fire marshal just decided to take a vacation day that day. Um, especially um, Tom Bell who was probably the number one fan of this basketball team ever and all of these guys will tell you that Tom was he was just number one for them and did a lot um, sitting in the front row and when there was an inbounds play making sure he was two inches uh, behind the ear of an opposing player just talking smack. I mean, it just, it, you can't even say it on camera, the stuff this guy would say. Uh, but Dr. Wireman had always said he wanted some kind of team on this campus where everybody could go and cheer loudly. So that's what we got. But, uh, he was an awesome coach and as fine a Christian man, friend, um, I mean, consider part of the family. I mean, I would go to church with him on Easter, and, and but when he got on the court, and he was still a fine Christian man, but um, he was a fine Christian competitive man, and, uh, and I think that helped us win certainly a lot of games. I've known a variety of coaches over the years. I have never, ever, and he was here 10 years, I never heard the man cuss. He, the worst he could possibly say on the court would be, that was a terrible call, a terrible call. That was the only thing he would ever say. And, and, he, and he would stomp up and down the court. Uh, there was I had Michael Eights in class, too. And um, I always kind of wondered if Michael was a little bit of a flake. Um, uh, he was certainly a nice guy. I really enjoyed knowing him. One day I was down here at practice, and... Toward the end of practice, uh, Aitz was shooting foul shots. And he said to me, Dr. Thompson, are we going to have a quiz tomorrow morning? This was in a Western Civ class he took. And I said, well, you know, it's likely that we are, Michael. He said, well, I really can't take that quiz tomorrow. He said, what could we do? And I said, well, Michael, if you hit 10 free throws in a row here without missing, I'll, I'll let you skip the quiz tomorrow. Uh, and since we gave about 20 quizzes, it really didn't matter. Um, he actually did, and he got to skip the quiz. And I don't know if we violated NCAA regulations with that or not. Uh, I'm assuming that the statute of limitations uh, has run out. Um, and so we are neither Michael nor I are in any danger of, uh, of, of being charged uh, with any violations for that. These guys all just were really good position players. Um, and I think because of that, there was no, there was not a star on this team. They all, every, each game it was, somebody else was the hero. Now, they were like baby squirrels because they had to eat about every two hours, seriously. We would feed them in the morning. We usually had a safe place where they provided breakfast. They would eat in the morning. Midday, they were starving. Lunch, they were starving. Mid-afternoon, they were starving. Evenings, they were going out and ordering three and four pizzas and buying liters of, of soda. And they were, they were just hungry all the time. I remember that, they were just hungry all the time. And we had, um, so we, we kind of had to plan around this this activity that, you know, the, the fact that they were just hungry. I guess they were growing boys. I have no idea. Uh, but in Italy, our breakfast usually consisted of one croissant and then hard rolls with some butter and some jam. And if you asked for another croissant, you would usually get a dirty look from the server in the, in the breakfast room at the hotel. So breakfast, let's just say, was not ideal. At the end of the trip, we got to Salzburg. So we were out of Italy, we were now in Austria, uh, we had a whole day of activities planned, and by that time most people had just decided that, you know, breakfast was just a lost cause. Well, we get down to the dining hall, I got down to the dining hall that morning, a breakfast room, and 
um, I, I looked on the table and there was this card, there was a buffet, but there was a card and it said eggs cooked to order and it was in English. Well, word traveled up into the hotel that, that we were getting a real breakfast today, all right? And the students, the players, just came out of the woodwork and down into the dining hall. We actually had to delay our, our activities for, a for about 30, 45 minutes so that everybody could eat. Well, there's Stacy sitting there at the table, and he says, he says to me, if they'd have had grits, you'd have seen tears in my eyes. He was so excited to have that breakfast. They were a band of brothers, and what they did here at Queens was essentially to lay the foundation for, for all of this. Those guys, the, the guys on that first team, the way they played, they played hard, they played together, and what really struck me about that team was how Dale kept that team together. To, to have that kind of impact as quickly, immediately as we did, um, I don't think people realize just what it took to get there. Uh, I don't think I really realized what it took to get there. And again, it, it goes back to, to the vision that Dr. Wireman had in selecting Dale Lair. Um, Coach Dale Lair was just a part of the community very quickly as well. I think he was absolutely the perfect person for that job and did such a wonderful job of working with us. And um, yeah, he will be the, the Queen's coach in my history forever. I know. Seeing him on the court and off, um, I got to see what uh, someone that I believe is one of the best coaches I've, I've ever had the privilege to know. And, and I certainly understand why his players were so productive and did such a good job, and also why they still remain good friends with him today. Uh, one of the things that we remember most, I think, about all of Queen's athletic teams, but especially these fellas, uh, is the, the character that they brought. Um, they made a terrific impact on us as a university, and I hope we did on them um, as they left. Um, and I'm really proud that I, I had the opportunity to, to be at Queens with them and to work with them, to be accepted by them. They just accepted me and, and made me feel a part of that group, and, and I will forever be grateful to them for that. Uh, but these young men epitomized of the phrase student athlete. They came to class, they worked hard, and they played basketball. And I'm very proud and pleased to say that I was associated with these men and I wish them all the best in the future. Good going, guys. We applaud the gentlemen, the lucky 13, who were the first members of the men's basketball team. We are proud of you. We appreciate your large contribution to what this college has become, this university has become. Uh, and are very, very proud of your induction to the Hall of Fame. Congratulations. Good. They set a tone for what athletics should be at Queens and have continued to be, so thank you guys. Uh, this was a great group of guys, and they laid a foundation uh, for which Queens can always celebrate and for which Queens can always be grateful.